Hello there friends, it's your boy here with another episode of All The Mods. I'm talking really fast because in the latest Roots update they broke growing standing stones, so we barely have any canola coming in, and eventually we're gonna run out of canola, and that means we're gonna run out of RF. Um, hey, yeah, just wanna interject here. It's, uh, me from the future. This, uh, growing standing stone problem that I reference and that drives the first part of this video actually can be solved pretty easily by placing down a lever and then right clicking on the, on the lever. Yeah, so energized standing stones need redstone signal now to work, which I didn't know. But I do have an explanation for my stupidity. This is the version of Roots I was playing on at the time of recording the intro. So if we look at the book, we go to energized stones, we can see that some pretty vital information has been left out. That's the newer book. This is the older book. It does. It didn't say, how was I supposed to know? We're gonna blame that on other people and not myself. Anyways, just, yeah. Sorry. But I do really need to cut to a time lapse of all the ore processing and farming and other areas we're gonna build today because I wanna get those done right now. Let's cut to that quickly. When you wake up, I'll be gone. I'm gone. When you wake up, I'll be gone. I'm gone. When you wake up, I'll be gone. So I think I've calmed down enough to give you guys a bit of a tour. I built quite a bit and we're not going to be using a lot of this for a while, but I thought it'd be good to go ahead and get most of the houses we're going to need in the future done. I built a little farm area over here. I think this is going to be kind of a supplementary auto crafting storage house. Uh, other than that, we just built a lot more pathways, a lot more houses. All these houses are just super basic. This is going to be my little livestock area, I think, so I'm going to do sheep farming and cow farming and chicken farming over here. And also one more house right here. And yeah, that's pretty much what we've done. If you come over and look at our canola situation, eh, it's still going down. The good thing is we only actually need two oil generators going at once to power our refined storage system, which is the only thing really using RF, so... It's pretty much fine for now. Also, both of those drums are completely full. But I would like to address this problem a bit. That is kind of quite a bit slower than I would like it. So I think we are going to do the whole greenhouse glass thing now. The problem is Elpec, uh, Elpec made it pretty annoying to craft. So now to craft greenhouse glass, we're going to need an empowerer. So we're going to need some ethetic green blocks and ethetic quartz blocks. Yeah, it's quartz and chisel quartz on the atomic reconstructor. And then we're going to need five display stands. We need a single battery, we're then going to turn into a double battery, which we can't do right now. Apparently you can't shift click in the batteries, it's okay. And then we can craft up the empower. And I also went ahead and made a power cell and a power cell card, and I'm going to link that power cell up to our main power network. Alright, so I'm going to run up here and set up the empower. As I said, this is going to be my little auto crafting area, and eventually we are going to auto craft with the empower. So we'll set up our power cell here, we'll put our link card in, that'll start filling up. So we will set the empower down, and the empower itself does not need RF, even though we're setting it on top of the power cell, this doesn't need RF. The things that need RF are these display stands that you place two blocks away on every side. And those are really going to start eating up RF. They do take 88, or not 80, 800,000 RF, so... So this empower is going to, as the name suggests, empower things. So we put what we want to empower in the middle, and then we put some items around it that give it the power, I suppose. So we are going to be empowering some palace, and to empower palace we need three prismarine shards and cyan. And as soon as we have all the items in place, that will start going. Tons of particle effects. You can definitely feel the empower working here. And after your frame rate goes back to normal, you know that your empower is done. It sort of acts like a global warning system for your empower. I think it's very intended. I'm just kidding, Elpec here. Particle effects are cool, dude. So now that we have our empowered palace, we can make some greenhouse glass. So we're gonna make 24 pieces, and then I think I already have some, yeah, pre empower greenhouse glass with me. And also, we're gonna make an angel block from extra utilities. So the reason we're making an angel block is because we're going to go all the way up to build height to put our greenhouse glass. And we're doing this because I don't really like the way greenhouse glass looks. I don't think it's that pretty unless it's actually part of a structure. And because it would just look weird if it was floating up there. But we are still meeting all the requirements. There are no blo blocks obstructing it or anything like that. So we're all good. So we're going to go up to like 250-ish. And then if we just right click with the angel block, it'll place it right at our feet. 
And then we know we're in the middle of our 5x5, so we can just place greenhouse glass from there. Alright, so it's all placed now, and we should be getting some more bone meal ticks going. It looks like we are. It's still not nearly as fast as these growing standing stones. I didn't actually realize how good growing standing stones were. Yeah, so that seems alright, but I did go ahead and I grabbed two of the agricarnations from our tree farm, and I'm gonna go ahead and transplant these right into here. And that is... yeah, that's pretty quick. It's still not as fast as it was before, I don't think. A little bit slower, but it's okay. I think that should be enough canola. We're actually out of canola in here. We're actually completely out of canola, and this is draining a little bit, so Ooh, hopefully that's enough. Alright, so that's kind of sort of fixed. And also, with the Roots update, they got rid of the Engraved Blade. So we have to use the Ender now, which isn't that big of a deal, but uh, it does take an extra hit. So let's continue on with this theme of slowly running out of resources, and let's take a look at our ore situation. If we look in our refined storage system, you can see uh, we're totally good on copper and tin. We haven't really used any copper or tin. It's stuff like iron. We, we don't have very much iron. Gold, we only have 40 pieces of gold left. I actually had to go branch mining for more redstone because we were completely out, so I went and got a few stacks of that. But yeah, our ore situation is not looking good. So of course, this is the part of the Let's Play where we, you know, make a digital miner or quarry or something of the sort. And that is what I'm gonna do. Except I'm gonna do mine a bit differently. Instead of making one of those quarries, I'm gonna make a Batania quarry. And like my tree farm, I know this is not going to be the most efficient quarry. In fact, it's probably decently inefficient, but it's just really cool. So I really wanna make it. So we do need to do a little bit of crafting to get uh, the quarry up and running. The first thing we're gonna need are some elven mana spreaders, which are like regular mana spreaders on steroids, pretty much. We are gonna need a couple mana detectors, which give out a redstone signal whenever a pulse of mana goes through them. And then we're also going to need a couple of bore lenses, which we've used before. And then using some of this pixie dust, we're gonna make some new lenses, some warp lenses. We're also gonna make a couple of Arc Tools counters, and then we're just gonna gather up a few just vanilla redstone materials here. And then finally, we're just gonna throw a piston into our mana pool and get a force relay. Actually, that wasn't final. We need to do one more thing. We're actually gonna create some composite lenses. So we're gonna combine the effects of two lenses into one, and we're gonna get bore warp lenses. And it's important we get bore warp lenses and not warp bore lenses, or else they won't bore the only warp. Alright, so we're back out in the desert so we can kind of see how a Batania Quarry is really going to work here. So as we know, if you put a bore lens on a mana spreader, and then we shoot a mana burst out, it's going to break all the blocks in front of it. That's pretty basic. And so obviously that's how we're going to be digging our blocks. We're just going to point the mana spreader downwards. The problem is that though, is that the mana spreader is obviously stationary. We can't actually move it at all, so it's only ever going to mine one column of blocks. But that is where the warp part of our bore warp lens actually comes in. So if we place a force relay in front of our mana spreader, I'm actually gonna place it up a block, and then we link this force relay to any other block in our world, what's gonna happen is that the mana burst, when it hits the force relay, is actually going to teleport to the block we bound it to. So if we shoot this burst out, you'll see it goes into this block and it maintains its momentum and keeps going upwards. So using that, we can move this block around, so whenever the mana burst teleports, it teleports to a different block, and we can move it to the side and forward and backward to make it mine a big square like a quarry would. So you would think if we just straight up move this block with like a piston or something, now the mana burst will teleport to here, but you'll actually see it still goes to this block right in front of the piston, because it's bound to the coordinates rather than the actual block. So instead of actually moving the block, if we actually push the force relay with a piston, the block moves. Alright, so the dirt block is in line with the netherrack, but whenever we press this button, the dirt block is going to move in the same way this force relay moves. So then we can shoot out another mana burst, it would go into this block, then we can move it over, shoot out another one, etc, etc. The problem we have now is that whenever we push this block, obviously this mana spreader is not in line with the force relay anymore, but actually if we push the block with a sticky piston, this is a sticky piston here, that block won't actually move. So if we just keep alternating regular piston, sticky piston, regular piston, sticky piston, this block is going to keep moving to the right, and it won't be affected by the sticky piston push, so it won't go back to the left. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to regular piston, sticky piston, shoot out a mana burst, 
It'll break the blocks, regular piston, sticky piston, shoot out of that burst. And of course right now we can only actually move the block to the right, but we can just set up some more pistons to make it so we can push it back. And then once it's back, I set up a couple more pistons and I reversed which one is sticky and which one is regular. So now we can kind of push it in the same way, but instead it's not going to get affected by the first push and then the second push will push it to the left. So now it's going left. And then eventually, once it gets to our desired width, we're going to have to make it go back to the right. So what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to push it with a sticky piston so it doesn't move anywhere. Push it with a regular piston so it moves one forward into the next row of blocks. Push it back with a sticky piston so it ends up in the row of pistons that pushes it to the right, and then we can start pushing it right. Yeah, so we can just repeat that infinitely. We go to the desired width, we activate the piston, we start activating the other row of pistons, and that'll just keep going on for as big as we want the quarry. So understanding how the quarry works is a bit easier than actually building it. So to build it, we're actually gonna go into the nether. There's an extra cow in here. Why do cows keep coming in here, dude? So the reason we're coming into the nether to build our quarry is because with a boar lens, you can't soak touch your fortune ores. So if we were to break a piece of diamond ore with a boar lens, we would just get one diamond. But with nether ores, you get the actual nether ore and then you can get regular ore blocks from that, and then you can process that how you want, fortune it, sag mill it, whatever you want to do. Also in the nether, we're going to get stuff like quartz and emerald and draconic ore and stuff like that that we wouldn't get in the overworld. And also those ores spawn on all levels, so we don't have to go down too far in order to actually get the good stuff. So I cleared out a bit of area to quarry here, oh, I didn't clear too much out, I cleared like this much out. Most of this was already flat to begin with, and we're going to be quarrying out a pretty massive area, I think. So the good thing about this quarry is that we don't actually have to worry about where we place it, it can go literally anywhere. So we'll start it right here, and this right here is going to be our input block, so whenever we input a signal into that block, we're going to want the block that we're teleporting our mana burst to, to move in the appropriate direction. So we are just going to pulse shorten that pulse and then bring it up into our pistons. And we have a delay of two ticks because that's as fast as you can actually push a force relay. If you push it any faster, it's just going to break, so we don't want that. And then we're just going to run that around with two ticks of delay into the other set of pistons. And again, that's as fast as you can actually push a force relay. So now if we place the force relay down right there, you'll see that it's going to start getting pushed around. Alright, so right now the force relay can only move to the right because we don't have a way of pushing it into this row of pistons here. So let's do that now. So we only want to make the block move forward and backward after we've gone a certain amount of blocks to the side. So we're going to use a counter from RF Tools to count that, and I'm going to give this a value of 3. So after three pulses, this will give off a redstone signal. So once it does give off a redstone signal, we are just going to bring that out and we'll shorten that because it's going to give off a constant redstone signal. So we want to shorten that to like just a short little button pulse kind of thing. Then with this shortened pulse, we're going to make a T flip-flop. So by giving this piston a one tick pulse, it's going to pulse really fast and either leave the block out here or pull the block back into here. And depending on where the block is, these repeaters will give off a different signal. So if the block is in front of this repeater, all that's going to happen is this piston will extend and push the block out into this row so the block will start moving left. And then if the block is here when that repeater activates, it's going to come downwards and we're going to do that sort of back forth and back kind of sequence thing. So we'll place our sticky piston down first. We will run this line right into this piston, just like that. And of course, we're going to have to block this off so no redstone interferes here. After this piston activates, we are going to put a signal into this piston. So this will activate second, which will push it back in front of the sticky piston. And of course, when I remove this force relay here with a regular piston, it's going to move the block back one. The sticky piston won't do anything. And then to get it back into this row, once it's over here, so we can move it to the right again, we are just going to activate this piston one more time. We're going to make sure we have two ticks of delay in between all these as well. Okay, so I did have to change this up a little bit because these pulse shorteners are kind of weird. Half the time they work one way, half the time they work the other way. So instead of putting a repeater into this piston, I have to put a piece of redstone into this piston. And now this works as a T flip flop before this piston wasn't toggling. Uh, but if we look at it now on the third pulse, you'll see that this force relay will get pushed to the other side which is perfect, and we can do that again, and this time, because this block got switched over to there. There you saw the block get shifted back to here. But this actually has a bit of a problem right now, so if we just link up this force relay with this block, it's gonna move to the right just as we want, but when we hit it the third time, 
You see it goes up one and then it goes to the left. Ideally we would want the block to stop here. I cannot, oh my god. So ideally we would want the block to stop here so we could shoot out some mana bursts to break the blocks underneath it. But because it moves so quickly we aren't going to be able to mine that column. So in order to fix this we are going to just run this line from the counter off into this piston. And because this counter is going to activate before this repeater, it will move this block out of the way so the left and right pistons don't get a signal whenever the block moves forward and back. So now if we start moving it to the left, on this third pulse it's going to move back but it won't move to the side like it did before. So that's absolutely perfect. And this is actually really nice as well because we can just change the number in this counter to make the quarry wider or smaller. So now it's going to go five blocks to the side before it moves forward and back, so now it's going to move back. Alright, so that right there is the block movement completely done. It's moving forward and back in a nice square or cuboid kind of, I don't know. So let's actually hook up the block breaking with the mana spreaders now. So we're going to put a couple mana detectors down. And as I mentioned before, these mana detectors are going to detect any time a mana burst goes through them. So we'll place two mana spreaders facing downwards because we are going to be digging downwards. And we're going to be using these elven mana spreaders to break our blocks because they can break more blocks than pulse mana spreaders can. But that's kind of a problem because we can't really precisely control when the mana spreaders shoot out like we can with pulse mana spreaders. We are going to have to just kind of place down a couple mana pools and just make them shoot like that kind of automatically but right now they're not going to shoot because there are blocks obstructing the mana pools but as soon as we place a bore lens on here the mana spreaders are going to fire normally they'll just break every block in their path of course so we don't want this to break all of our redstone so what we're going to have to do is lock the mana spreader that is not pointing into the force relay by just giving it a redstone signal so this is just a default function of the mana spreaders if you give it a redstone signal they will not fire so whenever the force relay is right there we don't want this one locked so we're not going to give it the redstone signal but whenever our force relay changes where its position is, we're going to want to move this redstone block above the other mana spreader so this one fires and this one will not. So to do that we are just going to use another one of these one tick pulse kind of T flip flop kind of things. So right now we want this mana spreader lock so we'll place the redstone block above that one. And we want to toggle this whenever this force relay changes position on this axis. I don't know what this axis is but forward and backward. So that happens whenever this circuit activates here. So we're just going to hook up some vertical redstones. So everything looks nice and pretty here. Then we'll just run this wire right up and then we're just going to lead that into this piston up here. And I want a, at least a three tick delay on this. I think two tick might work but just to be safe I want a three tick delay and I use three separate repeaters because we want to keep this signal as a one tick signal if we did this it'd be a two tick signal and then this block wouldn't get left behind whenever the piston extended and this is already getting pulse shortened so we know it's a one tick pulse so now if you start pressing our button this mana spreader is locked because there is no force relay under it we don't want it to fire so we hit this button a few times and once this changes position this redstone block will also change position, so this is locked, it won't shoot and break all of our redstone, this one will shoot, and the mana burst is going to get teleported and it won't break any of our redstone. Alright, so the last thing we need to do is automatically move the block, so we need a way to kind of know when to move the block and when to shoot at a mana burst. So as I said, these mana detectors give off a redstone signal whenever a mana burst goes through them, so we're going to just put some redstone next to those. And then we're going to run this around here, and we're going to run this into our other counter. So I'm going to put this counter on two, and then from this counter we are just going to lead it into our little input block here. And we're also going to add three repeaters worth of delay here. So every second mana burst, so whenever two mana bursts come out of these mana spreaders, this counter will activate and it'll move the block over one. So for every little column, we're gonna shoot out two mana bursts. And the reason we're shooting out two mana bursts is because the first mana burst is gonna break about 10 blocks or so, and then the second mana burst is going to break seven more blocks below where the other one stopped, or something like that. It could be like 10 and eight, or I don't know. But by shooting out two mana bursts, we're able to dig deeper down than we would otherwise. So this should now actually be completely functional. All we have to do is get these spreaders a bit of mana, and I have a full mana tablet to do that. And then all we have to do is just put on our bore lenses and it should start shooting out mana, but I don't want to do it yet. Before we actually start shooting out mana bursts, I want a way to collect all the items. Because when we start shooting mana bursts, we're going to get a ton of items flying up from these mana spreaders. Any block that a bore warp lens breaks is going to get teleported to the mana spreader that broke it. So we're going to have blocks flying everywhere and no way to pick them up and put them into our storage systems and whatnot. 
So to do that, we're going to use some modular storage like we did in the last episode. So we're going to get a modular storage block, and then we're going to get a remote storage module. And actually, we're going to make two of those. And we're going to need a storage module, and I think I'm just going to go with tier one here. So I'm actually going to put this storage module into our remote storage and create a new link ID for it. And then we're going to hook up both of these remote storage to that, so that is ID three. And then there's also this little button here, and this enables cross-dimension access. So I'm going to enable that, and that's going to make it so we can access this module from any dimension, but it is going to use a bit more RF per tick. So one of these modular storage blocks I'm going to go ahead and put into this house, because I think this is going to be my little ore processing house. So we will just place the modular storage here for now, I guess, and we'll put in our storage module. And this ID3 is going to be used specifically for nether quarries. You'll see kind of why we're making a whole new ID for it in a little bit, but I think it's the easiest way to do it. And also while we're here, we're going to make a couple of enchantment tables that we're going to turn into chunk loaders from persistent bits. And of course, because we're in the nether, our base normally would not be loaded, but of course we can fix that by just placing down one of these chunk loaders. So all the mods does have FDB utils, which has chunk claiming and chunk loading built into it, but I'm not a massive fan of that because it does that thing wherever you walk out of your claim chunks and it says wilderness, then you walk back into your claim chunks and it says your username's chunks or whatever. It gets really annoying. So I'd rather use these persistent bits, but normally in the pack, you're not gonna have persistent bits. It was removed whenever FTB Tills was added. So I added it back because I do like this mod and they're pretty good chunk loaders. So I am just going to set this baby down, I don't know, we'll just set it down somewhere temporary for now. So by default, this thing has a radius of three chunks that it'll chunk load. And if we just bring up our chunk boundaries, you can see that is actually plenty. Our base does not take up that much. It's actually like a perfect size for a little base. So this second chunk loader is over for the nether. Of course, we're gonna have to chunk load this so it runs whenever we're not here. I'm just gonna go ahead and place this like somewhere arbitrary, I don't know. It's a pretty massive area and we're not gonna actually uh, be coring that much. So I'm just gonna place it up in the air here so it won't get mined out by my bore lens. So then all that's left to do is just put an item collector on our modular storage and that'll pick up any items that fly out of there. And I almost forgot to link up the block to our force relay and we will link it up to this block right here. These boys are so annoying, I wish they would just leave. Alone. And I also remembered to extend the width of this thing. So we're gonna go 48 blocks. I think that's a nice that's a nice number. So now if we put some lenses on our mana spreaders, they st should start firing. Yeah, blocks are definitely spewing out. They should be getting picked up. They are. All right, so we can come over here and we can see our quarry is mining. Okay, my, my game just crashed, uh, but everything seems to be decently okay now. I don't know, I just relogged on the world. Hopefully everything stays fine, but we can see this working. Mining away, and we can see the mana burst teleporting to the block, etc, etc. This kills my frame rate apparently. And everything is getting put into here, so you've gotten two emerald and a bit of copper. But these spreaders are not going to shoot another mana burst until the other mana burst has fully dissipated, so that's why it's going kind of slowly. And that's why I like having this system where we have the mana detectors so we don't have to worry about timing on that. All right, I went ahead and made an advanced item collector because it seemed like the regular item collector was having trouble picking up all the items. There are some items, yeah, down on the ground over here. Obviously these items are flying out because uh, I didn't have a collector down for a while, but this one we can just extend the radius to be 10 and we can make sure it'll pick up all the items again. So now that problem should be fixed. Looks like it's picking up everything just fine. And you can see that our quarry's working. Oh God. Core is working perfectly so far. No hiccups at all. As I said, it's gonna go over 48 blocks, so it's actually almost there, and then it's going to switch up directions. It's actually really satisfying to watch. So slowly but surely, we are getting the ores. We kind of been a lead, a bit of copper. Copper's like the thing I need the least, but it's okay. Oh, and it looks like we did hit the 48 blocks, so it went over, oh, yeah, it went all the way over to here, and now it's going to the left. It shifted over one. Everything's working perfectly, this is pretty awesome. <laughs> but as we're sitting here just watching this thing go, we're building up quite a backlog of items in our modular storage. So it looks like I do need to take care of that. So I thought about it and I realized that the way I was doing it before is probably not the best way to do it. So I got rid of this modular storage here and instead we're going to input into our main kind of input system. 
So I made some ore processing machines here, and this is kind of temporary. I would, in the future, like to get some uh, mechanism ore processing up and running, but for now I don't really have the infrastructure to do that, nor do I have the time, because my module is filling up quite quickly here. So around back I've made some exporters and importers here. So I'm going to put an exporter on this alloy smelter, and I'm going to whitelist another diamond, another emerald, another lapis, another copper, and eventually all the other nether ores will go in here. Once I actually get them, I haven't actually got them yet. And I'm doing this because I want the nether ores to be smelted down into regular ore blocks. So we'll place the importer right here and that's going to import everything that gets output from our machines into our refined storage network. Okay, so I've hooked up a massive cable from my controller over there over to this ore processing place. So if I hook that up, we now should see this alloy smelter getting to work here, making some diamonds. Those will go in and then get imported straight into our refined storage system. And I went ahead and whitelisted the other ores that we've gotten. So gold, tin, and coal are the new ones. Now we're just waiting for some redstone and some iron, and I believe those are all the ores that we need to actually process. Well, at least all the nether ores that we want to smelt. That's what this alloy smelter is dedicated to. It's just smelting down nether ores into regular ore. And then this sag mill is for stuff we want to... So things like lapis will be good for just sag milling because you get quite a bit. I'm debating on whether I want to sag mill diamond or emerald or find a better way to process those, so I'm going to hold off on those now. And then in this sag mill, once we hook up a cable... Well, I don't have a cable, but this one will take all the stuff we will process normally, so like copper, iron, osmium. So once we hook this up with a cable, we should see all those things starting to go. This one is already doing lapis, so we get eight lapis per block, which is pretty decent on, oh, but just put that in there. All right, so what's actually happening right here, it, the platinum ore got in there, but we didn't whitelist it because these substratum ores have the same item ID, just different uh, metadata. I'm okay with that. I'll leave that like that. It doesn't bother me that much. So now whenever we get ores, they should go into their respective place. Obviously, I need to get more ores so I can uh, whitelist the other ones. And then the last thing I want to change up is actually how we're storing these uh, bulk blocks here. Instead of storing them in modular storage, I would rather use storage drawers, actually. Whenever I did this modular storage setup, I didn't actually realize how much storage drawers held. So while modular storage can only hold 300 stacks, storage drawers can hold a lot more. They can hold a ridiculous amount if you upgrade them. So we're going to place a drawer controller down, and this is another good thing about storage drawers and refined storage. So we can get rid of these exporters here, or external storages, because with refined storage, there's actually built-in functionality. So if we hook up a external storage directly into our drawer controller, and then we hook up some drawers, obviously. So we'll get rid of that, and we'll place a drawer there, and this one will be my dirt drawer, so we'll put all of our dirt in there and then lock that. So once we lock that in, we can set this to priority one, like we had before. And now this external storage, since it's connected to this drawer controller, it's actually going to interact with all the other drawers and it's gonna sort them properly. So right now we have nine stacks of dirt. If we put a stack of dirt in, it's actually gonna go into the drawer controller and right into this storage drawer. So now we can do this with all of our bulk blocks. So let's put cobblestone down and just fill that up. We're also gonna need a bulk storage for netherrack for sure. So I'm gonna go grab some netherrack. All right, so I went ahead and converted everything to storage drawers. And I put a tier five upgrade in this storage drawer for the logs because we already have a crap ton of logs and I want more logs. So we can put up to five of those 13 times. We're already storing more than we could with the modular storage. And then on this netherrack drawer, I'm just going to put a void upgrade on there because I'm not really concerned with getting more than 32 stacks of netherrack. So now whenever we put more netherrack in the system, it's basically just going to get voided. And then in these other spots, I'm gonna put some two by two and four by four drawers. And these are gonna be for blocks that I'm not going to get as much of. And now all that's left to do is just go ahead and relink this card. And we're going to link this to our main input here. And then in this modular storage, we just need to switch these two out and then everything should get processed after getting exported into our refined storage system. There it goes. Yay! And you can see how much this has dug. It's been a little while. I mean, it's it's actually going faster than I thought it would. And it's definitely getting the job done. We've gotten a bit of stuff from it. Unfortunately, it cannot actually mine cobalt, and I'm guessing it can't mine ardite either. So it is going to get stuck at those, but that's not a massive deal. I'm not too bothered about that. But it's definitely getting the job done. We're definitely getting the ores in, and now we're automatically processing them. So let's go over and check to make sure that's actually working. So over in our little ore processing room, it looks like everything is getting put away into the right places. 
We just got some emerald going in. Yeah, that's looking really good. So now we can go in here and we can just take this out because we don't need this module anymore. And we can put all of this stuff into our main refined storage system. But if we take a look in our refined storage system now, you can see we're using quite a bit of RS per tick. And we can see that we have one external storage using 30 RS per tick. That's because whenever you use the drawer controller like this, it acts as if you have a external storage on every single one of these drawers. So it is balanced. You can't just use like one RS per tick for this much storage. Okay, so I've done some more organizing in my storage drawers. I just took out some random things I thought I'd get a lot of. This is mostly just stuff from the quarry though. And things are still working well. We're still getting stuff. We cleared out a bunch of room on our disc by moving all of our ores out. And yeah, everything's working pretty swimmingly. But I think that is where I'm gonna have to leave you guys. We're running a bit long on this episode, but I think we got a lot done. Our quarry is doing work still. We actually have quite a big area already mined out. And yeah, I'm really happy with how it turned out. I hope you guys think it's cool and don't think I'm stupid for making it. But anyways, thank you guys so much for watching my videos. If you made it this far, you're a champion. And I will see you all next time. Goodbye. Stays on 50. She don't fuck with cash though. I don't keep none on me. Still tramping off the